Hi, my name is Matt Burns. I'm at the University of Missouri, but I'm in an empty office because I'm about to move to the University of Florida in just a few days. Uh, but I've been approached by several people to talk about my research around the Fonte Sapinel benchmark assessment system. So I thought I'd take a few minutes to do that briefly this morning. Talk about rights without levels. What does it mean to, what, to have reading instruction with small groups that are not based on reading levels, but based on student skill? First of all, reading levels are, uh, I'm sorry, reading small groups are, are very important. They allow for differentiation. Um, you, you know, with, with a long history of them, but sometimes they get a negative uh, perception because we used to do it with the old Red Robin way, et cetera. But within class grouping, you can see positive effects for kids with different levels of, of ability, reading ability and reading skill. But they cannot be based on level. Level does not equal skill. I'm going to quickly show you three reasons why we shouldn't assess uh, level to use that to drive small group reading instruction. And I'm going to focus my research with the Fontes of Pinnell, but I'm willing to bet that this is true for any leveling assessment system. So problem one, we did a study a few years ago and we wanted to see does assessment, these uh, leveling assessments, are they accurate? So we did a study, uh, the first one was to see how well it assessed reading skills in general. Here we have three, three assessments. Well, um, yeah, three assessments. I'm really going to focus on, on uh, just the one here for the FMP. So this is the Fontes-Sapinel Benchmark Assessment System. And we use their measure, and then we use their metrics and their criteria. And if it says if it was a, you know, M, and by the end of the, you know, second grade student should be at uh, a G. I'm making all this up. So we want to see how well that assesses reading. So we have the kids, basically, they can pass or fail the font spin out based on if they were above or below the criterion for that, that time of year, for their grade. And we use the measures of academic progress for reading. That's our criterion. Again, above or below the criterion, say they should be at 380 or above, then they are above or below that. So we have here with you know almost 1,000 kids, 900 kids, uh, all in second and third grade, we had 556 of them who did well on the MAP test for reading, the NWA MAP test, which is a good reading test. Of those 556, 367 of them also did well on the benchmark assessment system, which is 66%. So think of it like a grade, 66%. I guess that's technically passing, but that's, that's like a D, right? So it's not very good. Now, what I'm much more worried about is this. Among the 290 kids who didn't do well on the map, only 90 of them did not do well on the FMP, the benchmark assessment system, which is only 31%, which is alarming, which is shockingly low, probably the lowest estimate of identifying a struggling reader that I've ever seen. And then the overall crash classifications, 54%, which means you could spend thousands of dollars to buy this test Train all your teachers, take 20 or 30 minutes per kid, or, and you'll get it right just as often. It doesn't lead to very accurate decision making when it comes to evaluating reading skills. That's problem number one. Problem number two, a study we published in the Journal of School Psychology, we had kids read the book that was at their supposed level. So if they were an M, they read an M book, a G, they read a G book. What we found was we also had a different measure of reading. To, to group them at, as a low, middle, or good readers. Among the good readers, they read the book that was at their supposedly their instructional level, according to the benchmark assessment system. They read that book at the independent level about two thirds to almost three fourths of the time for high and, and middle readers. So for these kids, it may have underestimated their skills. We don't know, it may have. But again, what I'm much more worried about is this. Among the now small number, but still, among the kids who were low readers, 58% of them read that book that's supposedly at their instructional level at a frustration level range. Having those kids read the book that was at their level, according to the FNP benchmark assessment system, would do more harm than good. Those kids are not able to interact with that text. They're just going to get more frustration not going to learn. It's a, it's a bad situation to be in. And by the way, that's when we tend to see off-test behavior too. So for good readers, it might underestimate their skills, but for struggling readers or low readers, it, it probably under overestimates their true reading ability. 
And problem number three, so number one is that they aren't accurate data. Number two, um, the kids can't read the book that's at the level they're a low reader. But the third problem is, well, there's just too many differences among kids at the same level. So I but went with the teacher, I forget the grade, probably second grade, and I just took the middle section of that teacher's course, of that teacher's classroom. So these are all kids who had a G. There were 16 kids in this one classroom, all had a G, which is a lot. Now, I then look at the other data. So this is the map test, and I'm only going to look at the percentile rank, you know, 25th percentile or lower suggests that they're struggling. The FMP score, or reading fluency, number of words read correctly per minute, and percentage of words read accurately, percentage of words read correctly. And we can look at all these kids who read a G, and supposedly if we group them together, we'd have two kids in the same group. This one reading first percentile for map, which is a measure of comprehension, really, 26 words per minute, 93% correct. You're trying to tell me that kid has the same reading needs as the kid at the 73rd percentile for map, 80 words a minute, 98% correct? And they both have the same needs as this kid at the first percentile, 30 words a minute, 77% correct. There's just considerable variability in the actual skill among kids who are supposedly at the same level. So if I have you know, 16 kids and I can take the first five and make a group, because I can, because they're all a G, look at the differences in skill we're gonna see among those kids, among the next five, and among these six. There's just too much variability. That one score just doesn't capture everything we need it to. And then lastly, and I'm, this isn't really, a, I'm not presenting this as a problem as much as I'm presenting this as a possible reason why we see this. So we always forget about standard error of measure when it comes to assess, to test. Every test has a standard error of measure, no matter how good the test is. So if I give the kid this test, and let's say the benchmark assessment system, he scores an F. Well, the research we have done has showed that that's got a standard error of measure of plus or minus about two. So today it could be an F, tomorrow it could be an E, day after that G, a D, an F, and psychometrically those are all the same score. If we give the kid this test a hundred times, they'll score between D and H 95% of the time. That's about the best we can say. And that's called standard error of measure. That exists for every test that, that there is. Okay, so if the kid scored an H, their reading level could actually be an E. Or, in, or even a D. So it's quite possible to, to be the case. So we saw with that study where overestimating kids that's struggling readers, it's probably the case. The test said an H, but they really they are down here. And then I have a teacher who might say, wow, my kid was an F and they went to an I. Isn't that awesome? Well, standard error of measure of F is here. The standard error of, uh, I'm sorry, I said I meant J. The standard error of J is, is here. So if they go from F to a J, which most people would say, wow, that's great growth. Those two ranges overlap. So psychometrically speaking, these two scores are not different. They're roughly the equivalent. That's a problem with using the Fontes and Pinel just in general, but certainly to use it to, to show growth. It just, you have to take into account the standard error of measure. So if your kid is a J, they're really somewhere between the H and L, and you can't really say with accuracy where that kid falls in that range. So I think we should move away from levels and start think of skill. And we can use the National Reading Panel Big Five, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. What our task is to develop assessments or find assessments that, that assess them. And I've listed some here briefly, I won't, I won't talk about them. And to find the most fundamental skill in which the kid struggles. So they have low comprehension, low fluency, but good decoding, fluency is their target. If they have low comprehension, low fluency, low decoding, but good phonemic awareness, Decoding is their target. And we group those kids together and we use that to drive small group instruction. So they come to me as a small group and, and they'll get some fluency work if they need fluency, they'll dec get decoding work if they need decoding. And it might be within decoding, so I have to say 10 kids who need decoding. We break it up even more based on the skill. So you just get any basic decoding inventory and that'll nicely show you where those kids are. We use those data to group kids and deliver small group instruction. And I've done several studies that have shown targeting intervention is more effective than those than, than, um, than LLI or other approaches like that. And we just had an article accepted it'll be co coming out soon in, in preventing school failure that demonstrates it's better to target intervention than it is to, to um, use a leveling system or something like that. And by the way, one problem I, that I mentioned LLI is leveled literacy intervention, which is the intervention aspect of Fontes and Pinnell. 
is that when you look at the research on it, and there's several good studies out there, there's three or four really good studies, but if you look at the size of the effect, it's really quite small. If we think of this as being a medium effect, and this is the desired effect, these are effect sizes, man, the measurements, you know, DRA was actually a negative, but measures of fluency, alphabetic, star, even the benchmark assessment system, we still see small gains at best. Now compare that to something like Sound Partners, and you see nice gains regardless of the measure with one exception. Well, maybe two, I guess, exceptions. So we and the, the several websites have rated the Pontus de Penel level literacy intervention positively. They're rating the quality of the research, not the size of the effect. I agree, there's good research out there about LLI, but the good research is basically showing us that F and P data don't screen well, don't add variance, don't estimate reading level very well. LLI is not effective. The convincing research, good research that is rated by those uh, uh, websites as positive evidence suggests there's positive evidence that shows LLI is not effective. The good news is we know what to do. Now, again, this is all based on Fonsis and Pinnell, but we know it's true for DRA as well. I, it's just not the research I've done. But it's time to move on from levels. This doesn't work. We, we have to move past that. Think percentile rates. Use Dibbles and AimsWeb, et cetera, Star, Map. They give you a percentile rank. Use that to talk about skill. Group kids based on if they're low in fluency, decoding, et cetera. Use that to drive skill, to drive grouping, small group instruction. And when you do that, you'll see more positive outcomes for kids. Thank you.